I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. In my student days at Columbia College, those dim, dark days almost beyond recall, it was reported that across the street at Barnard, Dean Virginia Gildersleeve was warning her students, young ladies have an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. A caveat that today many thoughtful persons believe students, faculty, and Americans generally have ignored, not so much to our shame as to our imminent pearl, to a rapidly spreading moral illiteracy in our country, and ultimately, inevitably, to the closing of the American mind, the title of University of Chicago Professor Alan Bloom's brilliant new Simon & Schuster volume. Now, I don't know Professor Bloom, yet who could help but admire any scholar who, in deploring what is happening or not happening in our colleges and universities, says education is the sense that certain kinds of questions must be answered by Hegel and not Joyce Brothers. Of course, the message most people seem to get from Alan Bloom's enormously erudite The Closing of the American Mind is that essentially modernism is rotten to the core a function mostly of minds so indiscriminately open that there's nothing in them, no hard substance sufficient to help or perhaps even to permit them to choose productively between what's meaningful and what's not, between wisdom and garbage, what's worse, between good and evil. But deploring modernism doesn't necessarily remove one from America's mass culture shtick, after all. He's here with me today. But as one story about Alan Bloom puts it, and let me read it, the culture peddlers, it seems, are attempting to subsume the culture critic. On one recent day, Bloom flew to New York City and signed copies of his new book, The Closing of the American Mind, at Doubleday and Company, before taping a segment of William F. Buckley's firing line. Next, it was off to a meeting with his publicist and a round of interviews. The following morning, Bloom was a guest on CBS The Morning Program. One sentence, Professor Bloom, on how we solve this problem, the interviewer demanded. It was like Martin Heidegger being interviewed by Howard Cassell. He says, the professor says of his experience, so I hear you've got this new book called Being and Time. What's it about? He finds it all at once frustrating, embarrassing, and exciting. So goes this story, and Professor Bloom, thank you for joining me today. Why do you find it embarrassing? I'm not sure that I said that, but of course... But I, do you mean a, it? Well, no. <laughs> the, uh, I'm trying to think in what sense, uh, what I might have been thinking of, of course, as a professor. I have been teaching Plato's Republic, a certain philosophic distance from the uh, from the agora, <laughs> even though one has to descend into it. And my students watch me flying off to New York and seeing my picture in the popular press. But uh, I uh, 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 I have decided for these six or eight weeks that this is going to last to put. Uh, uh, those things in, in brackets and try to uh, digest them later and rather enjoy this. Of course, I don't consider coming to you part of a, uh, a, a popular press barrage, but a serious discussion. But we, we are still um, uh, taking the words that are so closely, tightly written in the closing of the American mind, and I'll ask you questions that are designed to satisfy my more uh, uh, plebeian mind and perhaps the uh, uh, the grousings of, of some people in my audience. Have you no sense that you're participating in the uh, this closing of the American mind? No, because the book is not, I mean, to return to your introductory statements, it's not, I, I mean, I'm not sure how one defines modernism, but there has always been a problem living in any society, keeping oneself free while participating in its best. And uh, I'm not a snob. The, uh, and uh, if one can still study and think, and uh, my, my entire, uh, the entire tension of me as a teacher is always to provide some inner standard which penetrates the whole of life. It's not supposed to be separate from America. Uh, the, uh, in some sense, the book is a kind of celebration of America that allows you uh, 
both to be comfortable and at the same time to learn, which I feel is a certain sense at risk. Uh, but I'm not speaking as a T.S. Eliot or a Henry Adams. And uh, I think there's nothing of that tone in the book. I mean, that's more attributed by, I think, uh, uh, the r uh, certain kinds of readers than uh, the real inner message of the book. Well, Professor Bloom, I must say, though, as I read the book, and it's so interesting to me that you mentioned T.S. Eliot and Henry Adams, I couldn't help but think of other Adams and the degradation of the democratic dogma. Couldn't help but think of the education of Henry Adams and of the I de me quality of their writings and uh, what I find in the closing of the American mind. You say a celebration. Tell me what you mean. Well, I'm a boy that comes from, or I was once a boy, but uh, comes from a family that's not well to do. His grandparents were immigrants. And within this society, I got a chance for a marvelous education. Uh, the, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of the reigning uh, idolatry, but it was uh, distinctly possible. And uh, it was that America, and the, the America in a way that I grew up with, uh, uh, from 1946 after the Second World War, you know, when we felt we had all fought a just war and the GI Bill. I started the University of Chicago at the age of 15. And that was the Hutchins plan. Started after the second year of high school with veterans who were in their tw late 20s, 30s, who had been war heroes, uh, but who had never had a chance to go to college, and who came to the University of Chicago and were reading Aristotle and thrilled by. It. That seemed to me uh, uh, the, uh, you know, an, an attempt to mix the, uh, the best things that the tradition has brought with a certain, uh, with a certain egalitarianism. Uh, I precisely think that Henry Adams and T.S. Eliot, in trying to attach themselves to places and times which no longer exist, to attach themselves in their whole be denied part of their own existence, that you have to, well, as Saul Bellow says, if, even if you're going to make the trip to eternity, you have to get, you know, at least in Chicago, on the train at Randolph Street. You, you have to pass through the experiences of your own time and place. And uh, I think I have a higher sense of the possible independence of the mind than Adams and Eliot do, or did. That's what, what I mean to say, that anybody at any time can with uh, proper resources, uh, touch what is highest humanly, and that uh, it is not in the reconstitution of other imperfect societies, uh, or in the long air nostalgia for them, that one becomes educated. Of course, that's a very hopeful comment that, that you make. And as I put the book down, I, in fact, wondered what your response would be to a question that I ask so many of my guests, and that has to do with where your bet is. You, you, you say, uh, my friends, it is in your hands. You say it in other words, but it's a Lincoln-esque notion. Uh, do you mean that? Uh, do, you, do you not have some sense of the necessary direction of this country that... Uh no, I do not, because I watched a certain kind of thought become vulgarized in America, which in my second chapter, uh, a kind of uh, what was once profound German philosophy become, I think, with no inner necessity, a language which was subversive uh, both of political freedom, as it had been in Germany, but also subversive of uh, intellectual openness. Uh, and I believe it was uh, that precisely it wasn't there wasn't any kind of economic or political necessity for that. It simply succeeded because uh, it w it was in, at least in its origins powerful. And I don't see any reasons why, when I look at the liberal arts colleges, in principle they could not change again. I'm not very hopeful. I'm not very hopeful that they will because many of the old resources were exhausted. But the book is an attempt to uh, at least offer a flag around which you know, people of all political persuasions, but who have some sense of the rank order of things, that, that, that you began with, the difference between Hegel and Joyce Brothers. And that's the critical. Uh, but of